During the time of the Tenguto no Ren, complications for the shogunate and the foreign powers was starting to become, I guess we can say, inflamed in the Chosu domain. But before we delve into that, we should talk about the maneuvers of Hidosubashi Yoshinobu, later to be known as Tokugawa Yoshinobu. The shogun at this time was, of course, Tokugawa Iemochi, who would have been around the age of 18 in 1864, so he was incredibly young. Yoshinobu was 27. He had also been nominated to be the potential successor of Yasada, the previous shogun. He was, of course, not chosen, and in what was known as the Ansai Purge in the years of 1858 to 1860, he and his supporters were placed under house arrest, and he was forced to step down as the head of the Hirosobachi family. However, after the death of Inosuke, the orchestrator of the Purge, which we discussed in the first episode, Yoshinobu was reinstated as the head of the Hirosobachi, which, by the way, was a part of the Tokugawa family. After all of this, in 1862, he took on the role of guardian of Iemochi, and after that, acted in his place quite often. In 1864, he was continuing to do so. He was trying to balance a tough act, placate the Western powers as they were much more powerful, and at the same time keep the emperor happy because, well, he's the emperor. This was effectively like trying to successfully mix oil and water. The emperor was demanding that all foreigners be kicked out of the country. And to appease his emperor, Yoshinobu had made attempts to close down Yokohama port. The western powers, of course, protested, and the port stayed open. So what did Yoshinobu gain from this? Well, for one, he got to tell the emperor that he was trying. He was able to further calm the emperor by letting him know that the shogunate forces were buying up western arms and that they were simply stockpiling until they had the power to finally kick the foreigners out. He just needed, say, 10 years. Emperor Komei reluctantly accepted this. For the western powers, well, the ports were still open, which kept trade flowing, which was exactly what they wanted. So they were happy. Now, in episode 3, we briefly touched on the Hamaguri Gate Rebellion, where Ronin and the Chosu men entered into Kyoto just to be defeated by the shogunate line forces of Satsuma and Aizu. The commander of the Satsuma forces, Saigo Takamori, before the conflict, well, he had tried to contact the Chosu to let them know that Satsuma had no animosity towards them, and that they themselves were more interested in increasing imperial authority. Same as them. Battle had of course taken place. Because of this, despite the intentions of the Chosu, the imperial court declared them traitors. Saigo Takamori regretted that he had joined forces with the Aizu and Shogunate forces. But had he not, it's very likely that the Satsuma domain would have been looked at in the same way that Chosu was at this time. While the Shogunate forces were in fact planning to punish the Chosu domain, it was the foreign powers that would deal the first blow. The Shimonoseki Straits were still dangerous for foreign merchant ships to sail through. In fact, they were avoided entirely and the Western powers were now tired of waiting for a response on if they would be made safe again. These powers threatened the shogunate that they would send a punitive force to Shimonoseki. The Bakufu, or shogunate, did not object to this. Actually, this kind of worked out great for them. Choshu would be punished and the Bakufu wouldn't have to dedicate any of their men. On July 11th, an American ship ventured near the strait and cannon shot slammed into the ship. After this, the Western powers made up their mind. An English passenger ship pulled into Yokohama during this time with two Japanese men on it wearing European clothes named Inoue Karu and Ito Hirobumi. They had just come from Europe where they had spent the last couple of years. Five officials had actually been sent by the Chosu domain itself to learn more about the Europeans, basically to learn how to defeat them. When word had reached them 
that these two had been sent back to stop the Chosu from going to war, the English minister, Alcock, agreed to send them on the ship Barossa, as close to Chosu as possible, to drop them off. They were dropped off on the island of Hime, with 20 days to get their lord's surrender. August 6th, they came back with their lord's response. The response being that he wasn't acting out of his own interest, but on behalf of the emperor. He was also planning on discussing it with the imperial court as soon as he could. All he needed was for the Western powers to abstain from action until after the meeting with the court. This wasn't what they wanted to hear. So the Barossa sailed back to Yokohama, and after the 12th of August, a multinational fleet headed towards Shimonoseki. Nine English, four Dutch, three French, and one American ship gathered at Hime Island and then sailed into the strait. September 5th in the afternoon is when the battle began. Admiral Rosen, I might say it wrong, would say this about the first day. Our bullets had barely reached the ground when the whole length of the enemy coast was covered in smoke. It was the Japanese who had only waited for the first shot from us to retort with a general volley. The whole scene was soon surrounded in thick smoke. Very luckily, a light breeze from the depths of the straits came along to clear the atmosphere. At 5.30, fire broke out in one of the batteries in the valley, where the lowest thieves were already plunged in darkness. September 6th, at the break of dawn, the battle resumed. The Western powers then prepared a landing party. 1,400 English, 350 French, 250 Dutch, and a squad of American Marines. At 9 a.m., the troops had landed and started to organize themselves in the columns on the beach with groups of Marines racing ahead of them and without any shots fired were able to penetrate the outer works of their enemy. This is what was said of the battle. In the morning, all the forts, except the Kushisake fort, were occupied by the expeditionary force. A few battles broke out on land during the afternoon. In the evening, the fusiliers retired to their boats. Eight are said to have died with 40 being wounded, though other sources say that there was around 72 casualties on the western side. They had also captured 42 Chosu cannons, as you see in the picture here. More raids were done throughout September 7th through the 9th on the Chosu fortifications in what they deemed to be the second part of the strait. The Western powers were now waiting for a surrender. However, none of the noblemen of Chosu wanted to board any of the foreign ships. Tatsuge Shinsaku, a adopted son of one of the nobles, signed an armistice in their place. The Chosu need to cease all hostilities, be kind to the ships sailing through the strait, and under no circumstance repair or build any of the destroyed fortifications. Just like Satsuma, after their conflict with the Western powers, the Chosu would actually have good relations with the British going forward. They weren't the only ones to be punished, though. The Western powers also expected the shogunate government to pay. United States Minister Pruin demanded $3 million to compensate them. This is about $100 million in today's U.S. dollar if my math is right. They simply couldn't afford this, so the Western powers gave them the choice to either come up with the money or open more ports and lower the tariffs to 5%, something that obviously upset the Bakofu quite a bit. But we'll cover that next time. Well, you made it to the end of another video. Good for you. If you haven't already, check out that video on the Siege of Ulsan, an incredible story where the Japanese held out against all odds. Make sure to slash that like button. I'll see you next time.